Happy Monday. Um, this week, we are following up on our last session two weeks ago to talk about nail board training. That's where we're training our dogs to file their own nails by scratching um, basically a giant emery board. Last time, we talked about how just to introduce the board and get the dog to actually put their foot on it and start to scratch. And today we'll talk about some um, other details of that training, getting more scratches per treat, getting your dog to use both front feet instead of just one. So um, let's get into that now. Sorry about that. All right. Um, nail board training part two, more scratching. So who is this for? Um, if you can't touch your dog's feet, this kind of training is, um, is pretty handy because it is a way to get some nail filing done without you touching your dog's feet at all. You do need your dog to be able to take treats in your presence, at least to train the way that I'll show you today. And ideally, you've done part one that we did two weeks ago, and your dog is already at least able to put their paw on the board or one of their paws, both of their paws, front paws. Um, if you missed that episode, the one from two weeks ago on how to just get started, go ahead over to our blog, which is dogkindtraining.com slash blog, and you'll, that will be the latest entry, will be the video from two weeks ago. Oh, as always, if you have questions as we go through the stuff today, the material, go ahead and post it right under the video where you're watching, and I will get to them. Okay, so what are we packing into today's video? Nail board training part two. We're gonna talk about how to get more scratches per treat because when we started two weeks ago, we were giving a treat for every single scratch on the nail board. How to get better scratches, more vigorous scratches. So we're getting better nail filing. Um, and then also how to troubleshoot when you've got a dog who has a really strong preference for one front paw and like they're only scratching, say with their front right paw or something. How can we um, get both paws working for us? All right, so first let's talk about ways to get more than one scratch at a time. So I'll show you some video examples of this. One thing that you can do is use a digging prompt, and we talked about that a little bit last week, um, and just wait for them to get to a second scratch. Often when dogs are digging, they're not just gonna do one scratch and stop. So let's... Um, Take a look at this. So here's a little pancake. I have a treat in my hand and I'm gonna cover the treat with my hand and he's gonna kind of <laughs> dig toward my hand um, and I'll feed him after he's done more than one scratch. Now, as you might imagine, especially with a larger dog or a dog with sharp nails, it's not always comfortable if your dog starts digging actually on your hand. So you may choose instead of your hand to have the treat under like some fabric or something like we showed last week. So after he'd done a couple paw movements on the board is when I release the treat. And remember, this is how you get started, right? If you want to build more scratching, you have to first get more. And so I'm not suggesting that you have to say, have a treat buried in your hand like that for forever, for the rest of the time that your dog does nail board work. Um, but it is a way to get that first sort of instance of the behavior you're looking for so you can reinforce it. All right, another thing you can do is just give whatever cue or prompt you normally use to get your dog to put your their paw on the board or do the scratch. And just after they do one scratch, you just cue again rather than rewarding them after the first one. This isn't something that um, you'd want to do long term. I mean, eventually you'd want to um, you'd want to fade out that second cue, but you you could start that way. So for instance, here, I say, hey, get up here, pancake. He does a little scratch. And instead of rewarding that one, I ask for another one before he gets a reward, a treat. All right, and eventually you could fade out that second one. You know, you just cue once, they do one, and then um, actually this is what this third bullet point is. Um, this is usually what I do, honestly, for most dogs, this works very well. After they've been rewarded many times for putting their paw on the board and scratching once, and then you always give them a treat. If now you say, okay, 
I'm going to tell them to scratch. They're going to do one scratch and expect their treat. And I'm just going to wait. Uh, most dogs will try again because it should work. And then you can reinforce after that second scratch. So I think possibly Jasper is going to start. This is my boy Jasper. So he did one scratch and then kind of looked at me and I just waited and then he did another one. And that's the one I rewarded. Now you still want to reward single. Here I'm just demoing. He's actually pretty advanced at this and doesn't need a treat after individual scratches. But um, when, when you're first starting trying to get more scratches per treat on the board, you don't want to say, okay, single scratches no longer pay at all. For some dogs, that will be too abrupt of an increase in difficulty in criteria for the treat. So I'm still rewarding you know, like at least half of the single scratches and just making sure I'm rewarding the multiple scratches more often. Now we'll talk about how to build on that. So it takes, I don't know, actually that nail board that's in the video that I have is actually quite abrasive. And um, I had to take a break filming with Jasper because he'd worn his nails down so much just in this little bit of scratching. So it's actually pretty efficient, um, but you still may well want more than two scratches per treat as well if you're trying to wear down your dog's nails. So if you want to move, you know, three scratches and beyond per treat, um, you can use the same techniques we just talked about, you know, either putting a prompt to cause your dog to dig at something, cue multiple times, or just wait, but now you're just waiting for more than two scratches. So maybe I'll reward on the third scratch. Um, since your goal, in theory, if you're doing this training, is to get more scratches per treat, you do want to make sure that your dog is getting better reinforcement for lots of, when they do a bunch of scratches in a row. That might mean a better kind of treat, or it could mean more treats. Um, it could even mean just more frequent treats. So every single time, say your dog does three scratches in a row, you're going to reinforce them. And then maybe for um, one or two scratches in a row, you'll reinforce them like half the time. That you want to make sure that what you really want is getting reinforced the best. And then you can slowly over time decrease the reinforcement rate for the single or low number of scratches. So you're mostly getting those multiple scratches. All right, so here's Jaspi. Let's see what we have. <laughs> one, I think he did three, maybe. One, two, three. I'm like, all right, I'll take that. One, two. So I'm still going to reward some lower number scratches, even though I, so I waited there and he actually switched paws. I got four scratches. I'll pay that. But I still want to keep reinforcing some of those easier ones early on when I'm trying to get higher numbers of scratches per treat. He has that kind of superstitious behavior. He does the scratch and then like looks at me like, I'm getting the treat now. <laughs> so that was maybe up to five or six for a treat. All right. So that's just number of scratches. But if you started working on this with your dog, you know that there is um, some variety, some variability in the sort of quality of scratches you get. When your dog is working at a nail board, sometimes they can be kind of light and not super effective at wearing down nails, and some are, you know, more vigorous. So first, if you want better scratches, decide what you mean by that. Um, sorry, I'm having a hard time. There we go. Do you want longer scratches that travel farther down the board? Do you want harder scratches so your more of your dog's weight or force is behind it? Um, those are different things, but you could combine them if you want in your criteria for reinforcement. Um, how to start getting these better scratches. Um, there are a lot of ways. Some ways I experimented with that I'll show you video of now is um, one thing I did was try different board angles to see if I tended to get longer or sort of heavier scratches depending on how I had the board oriented. So let's take a look. I think I have Jasper and Pancake in this one. All right, so here's Jaspi. Um, I put the board flat and you'll see that he did these really dainty little scratches <laughs> for some reason. When I moved the board up at an angle, I got a little bit better, a little harder and a little longer scratches, but not much. Oh, there I got a nice one. So I just reinforced, made sure to reinforce that. I tried the almost vertical board and I got the longest scratches this way because he lifted his legs so high. So nice long scratch, but a couple problems with this one. Um, 
with this angle for Jasper. One is that because he's um, there's no weight on that paw, really, he's lifting up to scratch with. So it wasn't a super hard scratch. The other thing is that Jasper is um, 13 years old. He's got some arthritis in his uh, shoulders and elbows, and he did not want to do this very many times. Even though I was using treats he really liked, after a little bit, he said, no, that's um, I don't like it. I think it was uncomfortable for him. All right, with pancake, I experimented with some similar um, angles. So here's a pretty vertical board. The problem here is that, especially because with pancake being a tripod, and if you have a tripod dog, you'll notice this, they have to kind of um, do a bow kind of motion and pull that paw back to, to get a good scratch. Um, it's not the same as a dog goes both front feet. And if it was vertical like this, with the board vertical like this, he tended to just kind of push off of it rather than dragging his nails along it. So not super helpful. There was a little scratch there. So here's a little bit uh, shallower angle. Starting to get a little more scratching, but still a lot of pushing off. <laughs> Extreme tail wagging as well. Um, I found when I got down to this angle with our little ramp, I started to get more of that dragging motion because he couldn't just push off as easily. So for us, in terms of board angle, um, for both dogs, really, that intermediate angle, kind of shallow on the ramp, was a good one for them. I tended to get a good combination of longish scratches, at least not super short, and have some force behind them so they're actually wearing down the nails. Now, no matter what setup ends up working out for you to get nice scratches with your dog, and you might as well set it up right to start in a way that sort of favors the kind of behavior you're looking for to start with, um, you're still gonna have some variability in the scratching you're getting from your dog. And this is true of any training, really. There's always gonna be some response variability and you can work with that to make sure that the stuff you like the best out of everything your dog is doing is getting the best or most frequent uh, positive reinforcement or treats in our case. So you can watch what your dog's doing. And when you see that really good long scratch or the nice heavy scratch where you can really hear the nails wearing on the board, make sure you always reinforce those ones if, that, if that's your goal to have those better scratches. So for instance, Pancake was doing this little, uh, little movement like this. It's like a little bow, but he wasn't yet scratching. Um, early on, I did reinforce that because this is the movement I needed, but now I, um, it wasn't good enough anymore. I needed him to actually pull his paw back. So I just waited. I'm like, nope. So there he pulled his paw back a little and he got a treat for that. He tries the little bow again. Nope. Okay. A little scratch. Yes, that pays. And then um, over time, I started um, waiting for longer, making sure I was capturing these longer or multiple kind of scoots back. So that one, for instance, I didn't reinforce at all. Now I got a couple scratches backward like that and, and that was a nice long one and he got paid there. So we're just shaping um, by differentially reinforcing the stuff that we like the best. That doesn't mean we have to go with zero reinforcement for things that are a little bit less desirable, but you can do it at a lower rate. Um, Sometimes if you go to zero reinforcement for the sort of previous step, it's your dog will give up or get frustrated and you don't want that. So it's okay to slowly decrease reinforcement rate for the previous step, the easier thing, and make sure that whatever serves on, right on the edge of where your dog, what your dog is able to do, like the best version of scratching they can do, make sure you always reinforce that. All right, finally, both front paws. Does anyone have a dog who is stuck on, like they only want to scratch their right paw or something <laughs> or their left paw? Uh, we did have this problem with um, both our dogs starting out. They had a very strong preference for one of their front paws and they would just scratch that one over and over. So what to do? Okay. So just like with um, waiting for more than one scratch, Sometimes waiting works. It's a little um, extinction-induced variation. In other words, your dog tries something that has been previously reinforced. It doesn't work now, and they're like, what the heck? And then they try something different. Sometimes it takes a while, um, but often that's one way, and that's the most common way I've gotten scratches with both paws. Oh, and do make sure that whatever your criteria is for 
their dominant paw, say your dog mostly scratches with their right paw, um, and you're say you're reinforcing four scratches in a row right now is like their best. And so you always reinforce that. If you're looking for the left paw, you want to get the left paw going, don't wait for four scratches on the left paw. Probably take anything they'll give you until you've got, you know, you've got some more consistent scratching with both front paws. I, I hope that makes sense. Basically, train the two paws separately if you need to, essentially. So he scratches, scratches, scratches with his left. Then he tries his right, and I make sure I cap, I get that. I reinforce that one. Now he's like, oh, I'll try my right. Great, I'm going to reinforce that. And now I can say, now, oh, I'm getting some right paw scratches. I'm going to wait for more than one sometimes. All right, here's the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is just setting up the training setup in the board to see if you can get your dog to give you more of that off paw scratch, like the paw they don't want to use. How can we get that more them more likely to put that one on the board? Um, so I played around with this a little bit with Jasper just to give you some ideas. Here the board is in the middle of the ramp, and Jasper's body is kind of off to the his right, I guess. And I found that when he was positioned like this to the right of the board, he would tend to scratch with his right paw. He'd plant his left paw, scratch with his right paw. The next clip I have him on the other side is the exact opposite. He plants with his right, scratches with his left. So that's one thing I could use if I was trying to get one paw in particular. But I found if he was on that side of the ramp and I scooted the board all the way to the edge of the ramp, then he would just use the closest paw. He didn't brace with both paws on the board. So that's just an example of how you might be able to um, mess around with your board positioning to get different behaviors so you can start to build. You need something to start with so you can build up um, scratching with both paws. All right. So does anyone have questions about nail boards? This is the, at least I was planning for this to be the last installment of nail board training. But if there's anything else people want to go over, I could do another one. Um, my dog certainly enjoyed it. Actually, um, my older girl did not enjoy it. And it's just, this is a reminder for me to tell you that if you have a senior dog or dogs with any kind of arthritis or anything, um, pay attention to any um, hesitation to engage in stuff like this. I'm fairly certain that um, this is painful for my girl and she used to do it very readily and now she doesn't want to. All right, so if no one wants any more nail board work, then um, I wanted to move on to nail filing. For those of you who um, can or think you might be able to in the near future touch your dog's feet, we'll talk about how to get them to that point. Um, but using a nail file, like a big emery board, it is a little bit better way to get the filing you want more even. Sometimes with a nail board, you get... Um, uneven wear on different nails, or you get kind of a funny angle of wear. And it's a little bit harder to get the, the back feet. You can train your dog to do their back feet on the nail board, but it's a little more work. Um, so my personal preference for my dogs is, and for Pancake now too, that I can touch him more, is to use an emery board and go over each nail that way. All right, so that we'll, next week we'll talk about that. Filing nails without restraining your dog. <clears throat> All right. There is the URL for the Facebook support group. Um, come on over if you like to talk with other folks with probably similar issues that you're dealing with. It's for fearful, aggressive, and reactive dogs. Um, I don't see any questions, so I will sign off for this week unless um, anything pops up in the next few seconds. Um, if you are giving this a try and are having success, um, shoot us a video. We'd love to see it. We could share it on social media to show, you know, kind of show off your, your training success. If you're trying it and you're getting stuck, um, shoot us an email at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at dogkindtraining.com. And um, we'll see if we can't help you get, get unstuck with that. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I know it was a little bit sort of more nitty gritty detail stuff today, a little more technical. And I showed you examples of things that I kind of played around with with my dogs to give you ideas. But of course, every dog's an individual. And um, 
the things that work for your dog might be a little different, but I hope this gets you thinking um, on how to keep making progress on the nail board training. All right. Have a wonderful week, everybody. I will see you back next week on Monday.